Hello, and welcome back to the Oncology Brothers Podcast. I'm Rohit Gosain, and as always, I'm here with my brother and co-host Rahul Gosain. We both are practicing general community medical oncologists, and just like you, we are trying to stay up to date with all that's happening in the world of cancer. More recently, we've seen a lot happening in HER2 space particularly. This is not just target in breast cancer or gastric cancer, but we have seen bucket approvals and more and more drugs being approved in this particular space. With that in mind, we have three part CME series where we are going to touch on the current treatment landscape of biliary tract cancer, and then take a deeper dive in HER2 biliary tract cancer. To get us started with our first episodes, we are delighted to have Dr. Ghassan Abu Alfa, a medical oncologist focusing on hepatobiliary space from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Ghassan, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Rohit. Thanks, Rahul. Great seeing you both. Ghassan, welcome. Over the next few minutes, let's touch on the current treatment landscape of biliary tract cancer, and then let's spend some time in appreciating the HER2-driven disease. So prior to the approval of immunotherapy, we had been using chemotherapy, and the overall survival there was close to 10 to 11 months. Then we got the approval of Dervalumab based off Topaz-1 and Pembrolizumab based off Keynote 966, and the median overall survival improved to roughly 13 months. So this is still not good enough, but currently that is our standard of care. Chemotherapy and immunotherapy upfront. At the time of progression, our options were limited to 5-FU-based treatment here. But more recently, we've started to look for IDH1 mutation, FGFR alteration, and HER2-driven disease. Ghassan, can you start us off with the treatment landscape for biliary tract cancer? And then let's take a deeper dive in the second-line treatment space as well. How common are these IDH1, FGFR, and HER2 disease mutations? Yeah, thanks, Rahul. If anything... Uh... Biliary cancers really are like the kind of like the uh, kind of you know unknown disease that really has been like really misplaced for a long time ago. And many of us remember the days when we used to call them the unknown primaries because many of them of the unknown primaries turned out to be cholangic carcinoma. And why is that? There's a certain particularity in regard to the uh, cancer cells that really is hard to define. And this is where I ask all our colleagues who are listening to us. Please, please make sure that your pathologist, you have a good interaction and engagement because your pathologist is going to be key in regard to pinning down that cholangic carcinoma. So you don't really get kind of on different routes or really on the wrong path. With this said, uh, the advent of the checkpoint inhibitors came into play. And of course, biliary tumors were really more understood as being the cousin of pancreatic. Rather, cold tumors will not necessarily respond. But that kind of enhancement of the activity of the Checkpointers by throwing in with the chemotherapy, making the tumor semi hot, absolutely did work. And that's why the Topaz one and the keynote followed with a positive outcome. Those two tests became very important because they really established that yes, checkpoint tumors are key to carry on with biliary tumors. Now, here things start evolving in different directions. One of the questions that we asked in regard to first line is okay. The study tells us that maybe chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, but then I stop chemotherapy at some point, like as in Topaz 1. And then the keynote study, which was done beautifully well by Katie Kelly and colleagues, uh, they did not stop the chemotherapy or the GMCB in specific after the six months. Why is that? I personally stand with the uh, keynote on that part. And frankly, I apply even the same thing with the Topaz, where Yes, you can max out on the platinum, but you have to keep the GMCB in because the immunotherapy by itself in that disease, as we just said to begin with, is a relatively cold tumor, will not work. It needs to be triggered by the chemotherapy per se. So great. We do this. People do very well. And interestingly, we don't want to promise this ever. And please, I tell my, I tell my colleagues, don't ever promise this to a patient because you don't want to put a very high bar for the patient. But have we seen complete response? Patient totally clear for the disease? Yes, we have been. we have seen that. And it's something that we're very proud that we're able to do in that disease. Nonetheless, sadly, sometimes, yes, things will evolve not in the right direction. Here is a kind of unknown field. There have been some studies in regard to chemotherapeutics. They are usually used based on some default or based on some experience. One of them is called the Fox, uh, based on the ABC06 study that um, 
even though it argued like maybe prior solar and platinum exposure will still benefit further on. The other one is the Nifty study, like Prosomal Antican plus 5 fluorouracil. This study never really made the drug approved for the, by the FDA in the US uh, for the Prosomal Antican uh, for biliary cancer, but nonetheless, you can try if uh, you have a, a good sponsor for your patients. And thirdly, of course, based by default, we did the study retrospectively, full theory might be an option too. Yes, we can use all of that, and probably most of the patients will end up doing one or the other of those. But interestingly, exactly as Rahul just mentioned, there are some potential genetic alterations that can occur in biliary cancers. It's very important to do all genetic testing on tumors like biliary cancers. Actually, I always jokingly say, when do patients do the genetic testing on their tumors? I would say, while walking to the clinic, before even they see any doctor. <laughs> because this information is going to be very critical for the patients. Yes, the numbers are not really in favor, but nonetheless, anything is better than zero is better than zero. As such, FGFR2 fusion can definitely be of implication regard to therapy. IDH1 mutation can be a good implication for therapy. And of course, now with the add-on of the HER2, as we just spoke. I'll pause here for a second, just copy the layout, uh, the, uh, layout but happy to vet a little bit more in any of those options. Hassan, can you actually take a minute or two and tell how frequently are you running into FGFR2, IDH1, HER2? How prevalent is this? So contrary to what we thought, and we're a little bit excited first, but I would say probably guesswork, the FGFR2 fusion will probably be in about like 5 to 7% of the patient. This is real world data. FGR, FGFR, other mutation, other alterations, which is sometimes based on some data like pemigatinib, you might apply the therapy, you might probably say up to 10 to 12% of the patient, and that's it. The drugs are approved based on conditional approval. Hopefully, it will turn into a full approval based on limited data of the phase two, but this is good phase two data. And then we jump on to the IDH1. IDH1 is a bit relatively more common, about 10% give and take. And uh, funny enough, the FGFR2 uh, came to us. We knew about it. We were comfortable. We pushed it. But the IDH1 was rather not even on the sponsor's uh, radar screen. They were thinking more about IDH1 for GBM. And we actually are the one who really brought in, tell them, you know, we really strongly believe that we should use this in uh, college question. And proudly, we did it. And very proud of the effort that we started at Sloan Catering. Now we have Avizadinib. And it definitely shows an improvement survival, actually based on certain statistical tools. You can say over a double median survival, and patients can do very well with it. Interestingly, relatively speaking, not to compare, but the ADH1, Avizadinib, is very well tolerated compared to the anti-FGO for 2 pm getting of fitibatinib, which can have a little bit of challenges, but definitely can be doable as well. And this, of course, brings us to the third one, as we just brought in, which is the HER2. Now, HER2, you know, uh, I'm sure many of us, uh, you, Aga, you, all of us, uh, all our colleagues uh, listening in the community will know it because of definitely more experience, more talent than any of humbly us in regard to uh, HER2 in regard to breast cancer, of course, the add-on gastric cancer, and now, whoa, out of nothing, biliary tumors. These are relatively uncommon, but nonetheless, kind of still range in the digit uh, number, but they are very important because, yes, data is coming out very frequently where it might be valuable. Interestingly, and this we didn't talk about yet, but we're talking about biliary tumors, but we also use some misnomer for other names, per se. Biliary is anything in the bile ducts. It's a big family, but in that family, there are different kind of like groups in this family. If it is a bile duct inside the liver, we're not, by the way, very smart. We're just like, you know, intra, inside, intrahepatic, inside the liver, bile duct, biliary tumor. That's how it is, cholangiocarcinoma. If it is outside the liver, extrahepatic, as simple as that. And then if it's in gallbladder, of course, gallbladder, the carcinoma. So now, proudly, we always really kind of like saw those as uh, being different, but we didn't know how to split it. I really, I'm very happy when I chaired the task force at the NCI for the happy liberty tumors, I helped out finally split them from each other. And after that, Dr. Javli carried on with the, with the effort and we do see them separately. And why I bring this up here? Because interestingly, the HER2 mainly apply to gallbladder cancer. 
But on the other hand, can we see it in extrahepatic intrahepatic tumors? Of course we can, mainly in intrahepatic tumor. And that's a very important point. A certain kind of like, you know, scenario in the clinic that happened to any of us. You guys have a patient come to you and it looks like, you know what? It looks like really right at the merge between the gallbladder and the, uh, you know, the hilum of the liver. Not sure where it's coming from. And it's actually HER2 positive. We're going to treat it like what? No, no, no. I'm going to treat it like because it's gallbladder cancer. No, but it looks like colonic carcinoma. Don't worry much about the anatomy. Remember, we just, as I said, like we just call it one thing or the other. The biology is really what's driving the picture. If it's HER2, treat it. If you have a wall blood that has IDH1, treat it as an IDH1. So that's really what's important. With this said, how do you test for the um, uh, genetic testing that we just spoke about? Of course, the golden rule, next generation sequencing. And as we said, when do with it, even before the patient come to you. But on the other hand, for certain, and specifically for the HER2, yes, can you do the HER2 by the IHC, which all of us know about? Yes, you can, especially for the 3 plus and 2 plus, we'll probably say be more comfortable with. But of course, always nice to have the whole next generation sequencing testing all through the whole panel of whatever alteration there is. Because there could be other alterations, we didn't talk about them, but they could be there, rare, but can happen, among which I'll mention at least the BRAF V600E, which is like barely 1%, but you know what? With great therapies. So it's very important to really look across the board for all the genetic alterations we can. Thank you, Samit Kassan, for that comprehensive overview. And I'll go back to your initial comment where you said working closely with pathologists. I feel like hepatobiliary cancers are the rather the poster child for a multidisciplinary approach. And that does include radiation oncologists, IR surgeons, and of course, pathologists as well. And Raul, as you alluded to, we are tied in with a poor survival, so we cannot stress the importance of NGS testing. Kassan, with regards to IDH1 or FGFR, we are relying on NGS. As you stated, for HER2, we have the choice of IHC or NGS testing. And we should not forget how some of these NGS reports are interpreted where they are mentioning ERBB2. It is still HER2 disease. How do you define particularly this HER2 positive status where these drugs are approved, especially for zanidatumab and TDXD, mainly in HER2 IHC3 plus setting? and all no thanks so much Rahit. so two points uh, please remember that next year sequencing is critical for any patient and in other words what you just implied in regard to the her2 testing by hc we're doing it as a default until the next year sequencing testing is out because we know very well that this can happen a bit faster and that's why so we don't delay therapy why don't delay therapy by the way it's very important to mind patients as well it's not like oh my god things are going to happen overnight this is not the patient you're going to treat anyway. But if anything, sometimes patient anxiety, want to be on a plan, people love to have a plan. And that's really what we all want to try to do. But please reassure the patient, if things are going to take a week, two weeks, it's not the end of the world. It's probably more likely than not they will benefit from therapy. With this said, in regard to now the staining, we've been kind of defaulting more toward the 2 plus, 3 plus, same as the many studies have done and reported, we're able to always depend on the NGS, but yes, we do depend on the HC for the HER2 with 2 plus, 3 plus. And the other thing is IHC ends up being in-house testing. So even though now the NGS is coming back quicker and quicker, IHC, if it's in-house, is a lot faster. Kassan, just to build a foundation for our next two episodes where we're going to take a deeper dive in our treatment options for HER2 and some of the side effects that we have to worry about. When it comes to HER2 disease, is this acting any different? Do we have to worry about more aggressive disease? Do we have to worry about how these patients can have a different metastatic spread? And then I know we touched on the frontline treatment in breast cancer, gastric cancer. From the get-go, we're talking about anti-HER2 therapy. Any patient outside clinical trial where you're using this upfront? Yeah, no, that's a good point. So yes, we are. And uh, if anything, as we know, the approval are evolving uh, because of the studies, et cetera. But at the same time, um, we don't have them all yet. And uh, if anything, uh, yes, when I'm seeing HER2, especially if it is uh, the 2 plus, 3 plus, as we just mentioned, uh, can I be tempted to make sure that I treat? Of course I am. And uh, I have to give credit. A lot of the uh, insurance companies have been really understanding that component, and they definitely will support us on that. Uh, so by all means, uh, for the Zenitumab or uh, for the... Uh, 
fam trastuzumab were definitely are dependent on the HER2 until we get the results. But are we doing it out of clinical trial? If we have to, yes. Even though we do our best if the patient is eligible for clinical trial to make sure that we want to clinical trial, so we can have hopefully better information and better understanding of the disease. Fortunately, we have these options available to us. Uh, but again, with regards to sequencing, it is going to be very difficult, especially when you have trastuzumab-based approach with tocatinib um, or pertuzumab and now TDXD as well as zanidatumab. Uh, Gasson, with regards to testing, are you testing this upfront or on progression? Thanks so much, Rohit. So most of the patients, and if anything, our patients who come to us from the start, we do it right at the start. Uh, now, understandably, sadly, sometimes patients might not have been tested before, and we have to do it up on the progression because they come for a second opinion for second line therapy. So we do it at that point in time. But I please urge all our colleagues, please don't try to wait. Ah, I don't need it now. I have Gemsys, Dervalumab. I'm okay. I'll do it when I need it. Guess what? Time is much longer when you need it. So just do it in the beginning so you have it. Keep it on the shelf do it or use it whenever you have to, rather than wait. Now you bring another important point though, is would it matter if I have to test it at both times, being at the start as well as a progression? That's a fascinating component in regard to the stressors of the therapy onto the tumors. Interestingly, the genetic alterations of the tumors, and we tested that at Sloan Catering, in about 76% will never change. On the other hand, though, in regard to the FGFR2 and the IDH, uh, interestingly, the structure of the therapy, specifically anti-FGFR2 or anti-IDH, can actually cause a structure onto the tumors. And i.e., a tumor can it change from being a certain genetic specific alteration for the FGFR2 to another? Yes, it can. Actually, there's a beautiful paper that was reported beforehand that showed how those tumors might be stressed out enough that the genetic alteration can occur. This was done again by uh, uh, Lipika Goyal and colleague at MGH when she was at MGH. And another one in regard to H1H2, we probably did it from Sloan Kettering, and we have seen that a tumor can change from the IDH1 to the IDH2. So, yes, at the moment we're doing it at baseline, uh, at start of therapy, um, but by all means, futuristically, we might see ourselves testing more than one occasion. We would have to jump on the same bandwagon. These are not resistant mutations. Yes, you can see these stressor mutations evolve and the disease has evolved some, but testing upfront, BFR, IDH, HER2, and FGFR, I think is very important. Correct. Again, such a heterogeneous tumor and glad to have multiple therapies available, especially when we are tying in with a poor overall survival. Absolutely. Hassan, thank you so much for taking the time to go over the current treatment landscape and rapidly evolving space for HER2 positive biliary tract cancer. Make sure to check out our next podcast in the series where we take a deeper dive into the data for our available options in the HER2 space and also discuss how to manage some of the common side effects that we see with these therapies. Thanks for joining us. We are the Oncology Brothers.